Our Father, we come and stand before you, uh, Lord, as needy people, as people who don't have all the answers, Lord, and uh, Lord, as people who even when you've given us answers, Lord, need your help day by day, uh, Lord, to, to apply those things in our lives. So we do come and appeal to you, Lord. We say, please uh, don't leave us to our own thoughts this morning, but please may we hear clearly what you want to say. Lord, where it challenges or comes into conflict with our understanding, please would you help us to submit to your uh, correction even, Lord. Uh, Lord, uh, lift our eyes from our perspectives to yours, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do take your seats, please. What I'd like to share this morning is the first of the free talks which I shared at the conference. Uh, besides practical reasons for doing that, um, I wondered if it might be a, a nice, knowing that uh, a number of you wanted to have been there, um, that you could at least hear a part of uh, what we were looking at. And then hopefully tomorrow at some point, the rest of the talks, well all the talks, uh, should go on the IFB YouTube page so that you can... Uh, Listen to the rest if you uh, want to or feel so led. What I was looking at in the conference was the topic of God's judgment. Not the most exciting, you might think, uh, or lifting of topics, and yet it really uh, blessed and challenged me as I was studying it, and um, we felt that it was, um, along with Josh's talks, that it kind of uh, was something the Lord was trying to say to us at the conference uh, about our attitudes to God's judgment. And it's that particularly that I want to look at this morning. What our attitudes can be to God's judgment and God's wrath and um, God's ways and heart uh, over the matter of judgment. Uh, and we did go on then in the other talks to look at God's attitude. What does God think and feel when he's having to judge? And also at what his methods were. Um, and we prayed through some of that. But today we're just going to look at what, God's, what our attitudes can be to God's judgment. We don't often come across teaching about God's judgment within the wider church. It's one of those topics that uh, people don't like to think about, isn't it? Uh, you and I probably, if we're honest, don't enjoy thinking about what happens to the wicked. Uh, what the Lord does in this world and also in the life to come um, as judgment. And therefore, it will often be ignored. Sometimes actively spoken against, but usually just ignored. It's one of those inconvenient things that we as believers, we, we kind of know is true, but it's not as exciting or uplifting to think about as God's love and God's mercy and God's grace and God's kingdom and God's power. And so we sing all the songs about those things and we take all the passages about those things, but... Yeah, I don't know if you can think of many songs about judgment. I can't. And uh, we don't often uh, hear in the wider church it preached on. Why is that? Is it because the Bible says very little about it? Well, no. Huge swathes of the Bible are devoted to it. Huge sections, uh, we think, particularly of the prophets uh, and also of big sections of Revelation. But there's many other references throughout the Bible. Uh, and we see judgment at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. All the way through, there are sections that tell us about God's judgment. So it's not because the Bible says very little about it. Is it because the Bible's not very clear? Is it one of those topics where you think, well, it, one passage says this, but another passage says this, and this passage is a bit vague, uh, so we can't really say anything conclusive? No. The Bible couldn't be clearer, really, that God uh, is a God of judgment as well as a God of love. And in fact, some passages are so clear and so graphic that they can make uncomfortable reading sometimes. So the Bible is certainly clear. Is it because it's not an important issue? You know, it's not a central doctrine. It's not one of those things that must be considered, uh, unlike other things. Uh, and so we can just do away with it because it's not really essential. Well, no. Again, the Bible tells us that God's justice, and by implication his judgment, is a central part of his character. The Psalms tell us that it's the foundation of his throne. 
says that in more than one place. It's part of his character. When God proclaimed his character to Moses, I mean, the Lord couldn't sum up his character in just a few lines. And yet, after speaking about his compassion to those who love him, he then clearly speaks about his judgment to those who hate him. It's a clear part of what God is like. It's also a central aspect to history that we see in the Bible, and a central aspect to the future and to our eternal destiny. So we can't say that it's not important. So why is it given so little attention in the church? Well, I'm going to share a few reasons this morning, and then we're going to ask what would a right attitude be to God's judgment. And I hope that as we consider these things, it will challenge our own hearts and minds, and our prayer lives too, um, both in encouraging us to pray more and maybe shaping the direction that sometimes we might pray. Well, the first reason I think why uh, judgment is given little place within the church uh, is a wrong belief or teaching about the Old Testament versus the New. A wrong belief or teaching about the Old Testament versus the New. There's a belief very often that Jesus changed everything when he came, brought a message purely of love, and did away with the idea of judgment. For example, people will point to the woman caught in adultery that's brought before Jesus, and Jesus says that when others don't condemn her, neither do I condemn you. Of course, uh, just before that, we see that various people were convicted by Jesus' words. And just after that, Jesus tells her to sin no more. Perhaps there's the implication that if she goes on sinning, he will condemn her. But people can take some words of Jesus and the fact that a lot of what he said was loving and that there is such an emphasis on grace in the New Testament and can say, therefore, Jesus has changed all of that. Well, Jesus did, in one sense, change everything. His coming into the world was a massive shift uh, in our history. It was the central point of history. And so much was changed. Many of the Old Testament rules, ceremonial and sacrificial, were done away with by the Lord Jesus for believers. And yet, there is so much in the New Testament that shows judgment is very much still in God's economy. Jesus himself spoke a lot about judgment. He had some harsh words to say for some people in his ministry, speaking to the Pharisees, even saying to them, how will you escape the sentence of hell? He cleansed the temple very thoroughly. That was really an act of judgment uh, as well as of purification. Um, he didn't beat about the bush. He didn't go around saying, would you mind closing your stall, please? He went around with a whip and he purged that temple and spoke clearly about why he was doing it. He was basically making clear it was a judgment saying, this is meant to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus also affirmed a very important Old Testament principle about judgment. Uh, and it's something we considered in another talk at the conference, where the Lord says in his revelation of his character in Exodus 34, that he visits the sins of the fathers on the children. And in that other talk at the conference, we considered what that meant and what it didn't mean and, and how it relates to God's justice and his mercy. But Jesus, in Matthew 23, speaks to the Pharisees after condemning them seven times, he says, fill up the measure of your father's guilt and speaks about the blood of past um, murders being reckoned with that generation. Jesus didn't do away with God's revealed character judgment. He affirmed it. And in Revelation, there's no shortage of judgment, including by Jesus, where we see in Revelation 19, the Lord's robe dipped in blood. By implication, the blood of his enemies. It speaks there about him treading the winepress of the fierce wrath of God and having a sharp sword to strike down the nations and judging and waging war in righteousness. So we can't say that Jesus changed everything and no longer was there to judge. In his time on earth, he may have been holding back. 
but there's going to come at another time when he is going to judge the world in righteousness. And before we move on from this point, we might say it's not just Jesus. Did New Testament believers show a completely different attitude where they no longer would condemn or judge anybody? Well, no, we do see fewer of those examples, but we considered in the Bible study recently about Ananias and Sapphira. Peter didn't beat about the bush, inspired by the Holy Spirit, when they had committed a great sin to the Lord rather than just to man. Peter had to bring that message of judgment and they died. Paul told somebody, and I don't think we would use these words uh, lightly, but he said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Uh, this is the same Apostle Paul who brought the wonderful uh, passages that we like to dwell on in the church of, uh, of the Lord's grace and mercy. And yet he's here telling somebody God is going to strike them. Paul, as... Uh, we, were, uh, we considered in 2 Thessalonians quite some time ago, uh, said in chapter 1 that it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflicted the believers then. He said this is quite right, this is quite just. They've afflicted you. Of course, if they repented, they would be forgiven. But if they're not going to, Paul says, it's quite just that God will afflict them. And there's various examples in Revelation which we can't consider this morning, where believers praise God and even rejoice in God's judgment. Now there is a shift in the New Testament. There is more, I think, of a focus on loving even our enemies and the lost and praying for them. And of course there is the difference between our enemies and God's enemies. So if somebody hurts us, we are called to forgive them and pray for them. But if somebody really stands against God... That is a different um, kettle of fish, shall we say. And while we do pray for them to turn and cry for the Lord to uh, convict them, there may be times when actually the Lord is wanting to judge them. So there is a shift in the New Testament, but not a shift completely away from judgment. The second reason, a big reason why we cannot focus on the Lord's judgment or have a wrong attitude is because the effect of our culture on us. We live in a culture of tolerance, of relativism, where it's all about what each person thinks is right, and therefore to suggest that people are sinful and doing wrong uh, is an anathema to our culture. And to go even further and say, not just are you doing wrong, but you're going to be judged for it if you carry on, that is abhorrent to our culture. Our culture also has become very, very sensitive to suffering and cruelty, and rightly so in many ways. We're glad that we don't live in a culture now where children are meant, uh, sent to work long hours in dangerous conditions, in factories, for example. We're glad that people are aware that it's important not to be cruel to animals, for example. These are good things, and yet it can also mean that the idea that God might judge people and that people might suffer for doing evil, our culture reacts against it and it can affect our hearts as well. And with our culture so against the idea of judgment, this can mean we're actually embarrassed by God's judgment. And we question it ourselves because our culture can't agree to it. And it can influence our hearts, and it can influence the way we speak to people, um, and, and how we witness to people, and how we share about um, God's nature and his judgment, because we are embarrassed. Or we start even to not believe it ourselves, because we can be so taken in by what the world out there wants to believe. Well, of course, God wants us to be free from worldly influences. And he wants us to listen to his perspective and not theirs. A related reason to this is our natural emotions. Our natural pity for others. Helped by our culture, our natural emotions and pity for others can mean we shrink from considering God's judgment and agreeing with it. Now, as I've said, compassion and pity are very important. And we should be full of it in many ways. 
but not at the expense of siding with humanity rather than God. When there is a clash between the two, we always must come down firmly on God's side. Even if our emotions are saying, but they're going to suffer. Well, we pray that they won't do. But when it comes down to it, when God says, on which side are you? Are you on humanity's side or mine? Our call is to be separate and to come on God's side. Now, I think we can relate to what Paul says in Romans 9. Because in Romans 9, Paul starts out by saying, I have unceasing grief for my fellow Jews. He is so sorry for the state they're in and the, the eternity they're headed to, that he even goes so far as to say what I think we would struggle to say, say, I could even wish myself accursed for them. There is no lack of pity in the heart of Paul. But in the very same chapter, Paul vigorously defends God's justice and God's choice and God's having vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. He points out that God has every right to judge us because all have sinned. And he says there is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. He recognises that we might question whether there is injustice with God. says, may it never be. That is impossible. Whatever our hearts say, whatever our pity and emotions say, it is impossible for there to be injustice with God. And he even goes on to say, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? There is very dangerous ground that we can be on if we start to question and say, well, are you really just, Lord? Uh, I know the Bible says this, but Lord, what about this? Paul says, no, there is no injustice with God. There's a passage in Ezekiel 9, and I appreciate we're not turning to many passages today, but uh, feel free if you want to, or to note them down, look them up afterwards. But there's a passage in Ezekiel 9, where as the passage goes on, God brings Ezekiel to a place where he says that the nation's sins are very great, and therefore he won't pity But we see also uh, in Ezekiel that there is a place where God brings Ezekiel, and I think we're going to consider it um, a little bit later. Yeah, in, in Ezekiel chapter 8, the previous chapter, God brings them to see, brings Ezekiel to see the sins of the nation. And therefore, when his, God comes to uh, Ezekiel chapter 9, and he comes to bring judgment in verse 5 of Ezekiel 9, he tells his six servants to judge and to kill those who have rebelled against him, and not to have pity or to spare. Maybe God recognised the tendency that we can have to pity when we must instead side with his judgement, but he tells them not to pity or to spare. That echoes something in, earlier in the Old Testament where the Israelites were twice told not to pity those who deserve death under the Old Testament regulations. In Deuteronomy 7 and verse 16, the nations of Canaan who were going to be dispossessed, God tells the Israelites, don't pity them. And we hear elsewhere that they had been doing all kinds of things wrong, even putting their children to death in the fire as a sacrifice to their gods. And God says, because of their sins, don't pity them. God tells in Deuteronomy 13 that when one person seduces the nation to idolatry, even if it's your own child or your wife or your friend as your own soul, they were told, don't pity them. You must judge them because otherwise it would cause further damage. Now we might think, ah, oh, well that's the Old Testament, isn't that? Well, in Zechariah 13 and verse 3, speaking about the future... It describes parents doing that exact same thing to their children if they prophesy falsely in the name of the Lord. It says that their parents will thrust them through. Now these are uncomfortable things to consider. Whether that will be literally fulfilled uh, is for us to see in the future. But there is that principle there. It says even in the future to come, people will have a zeal for God that even their own children they will judge in some way. <laughs> 
if they rebel against the Lord. And that brings us on to our final reason why we can sometimes have the wrong attitude to God's judgment. It's a lack of zeal for God and for his righteousness and his holiness. I mentioned Jesus cleansing the temple. And when he did that in John 2 and verse 17, the disciples, it says, remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus was motivated by zeal for his Father. Yes, he did love and care for people, and we see that in a lot of his ministry. But when he, God's house was not in order, that zeal for his Father drove him to judge it. It was zeal for God that led David and others to write those psalms which call for the wicked to be judged. It was zeal for God that led Aaron's grandson Phinehas to rise up and kill two people, prominent people in the congregation, when Israel was intermingling and committing idolatry with Moab. The Lord praised him and said, he has shared my jealousy. There was a zeal in Phinehas where he recognised that no matter how attached he was, to his fellow people, and no matter what other people might think of what he was going to do, he had to put God first. God's name was at stake, God's honour was at stake, obedience to God was being challenged, and he had to put it right. If we have a true love and a zeal for God, it will deeply pain us when God is hated or mocked or rebelled in our, against in our society. It will hurt us even more than if our spouse or our other family member, our children, our parents, our close friends are maligned or hurt. We should be concerned when they are, but zeal for God should be at the top of our list. I'm not in any way saying I am here at this. I'm not in any way saying that I have reached that point. But the call is there. The call is there to put zeal for God first. In that passage in Ezekiel 9, just before judgment falls, God puts a mark on those who sigh and cry at the abominations happening in their land. There was a people who had a zeal for God. And it made them mourn and groan. I don't know how often you groan at the sins of the nation. I can't say that it happens within me very often, or certainly not out loud. And yet God calls us to be a people who he can so work in that the things that are going wrong, of which there are many things in our nation today, they make us groan. Because our zeal for God means that we are hurt at how he and his laws are being treated. And so this has an implication for our prayer because when we come to pray and we want to pray for God to turn people and we want to pray for others, actually the biggest priority to pray is, Lord, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. The Lord Jesus in his pattern prayer puts those first before we pray for our or others' needs. Says, Lord, may your name be hallowed. That is our highest priority, more than intercession for people in our land, though that is so important, and it's something which my work is very much taken up with. The most important priority is hallowed be your name. So what is it with these reasons we've just considered of the wrong belief about the Old Testament and our being influenced by our culture and our natural emotions and our lack of zeal for God? What is the problem? Ultimately, one way or another, it's a fleshly mindset. In Revelation 6, let me read you a few verses. Uh, in Revelation 6 and verses 9 to 11, where we have a very interesting picture of what's going on in heaven. Revelation 6 and verse 9. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, 
will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. These souls under the altar, these believers who had become martyrs, now are out of the world. They are now in heaven. They've not got the imperfections of this world anymore. They've not got the influence of their culture anymore. They've not got a fleshly mindset anymore. And here's what they pray. How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? These are not praying from a fleshly mindset anymore. Their prayer here is not wrong. And you notice God doesn't criticise them. In fact, God clearly agrees with them. God doesn't say, oh, I'm not going to do that. The implication is, I am going to do that, but not yet. God says, wait a little while longer, and then I am going to avenge your blood. Then I am going to judge those who are on the earth. That's the implication from what God is saying. And it's the illustration there of that heavenly mindset that we are called to have, that is so different from what our nature wants, perhaps. But we are called to have that attitude. Why do I say that? Because we're told that we're in status, seated in heavenly places. Tony reminded of this in a talk recently. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ, thanks to the ascension of the Lord Jesus. But do we realise what that means? It doesn't just mean we can be seated in a heavenly place where we have a perspective of God's help for us and God's strength and Him as our refuge. It also means that we are called to have a different mindset that might challenge our earthly heart. That we are called to pray in certain ways that maybe our earthly mindset doesn't want to pray. That maybe is along the lines of what these believers here who have been brought into the perfections of heaven, are able to pray. And part of taking on Christ's nature, as we see the New Testament tells us that Christ is to be formed in us, part of taking on Christ's nature is to think how Christ thinks, in his love and his compassion, in his truth, and in his justice and judgment. And so having considered these factors that may hinder us from having a right attitude to God's judgment, let's finally ask, what should our attitude be towards the Lord's judgment? Let me share briefly three things that we should have. The first is, we should acknowledge and agree with God's judgment. We should acknowledge and agree with God's judgment. I mentioned Ezekiel 8 where God brings Ezekiel in visions to Jerusalem and shows him various sins that seem to be getting worse on worse and worse. And then he says he's going to deal in wrath with them without pitying and sparing. It's like God wants him to understand first of all why he's going to judge and then tells him he is going to judge. Sometimes we need our eyes open to the sin of the nation to understand why God is to judge, and then we can agree with it. Three times in Jeremiah, God says, Shall I not punish these people, declares the Lord, and on a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? It's funny God is asking this, isn't he? Because God doesn't need to ask people for their opinion. He doesn't need to ask people for their approval. He doesn't need to say, shouldn't I judge them? It's not that God's insecure. It's not that God is kind of, hmm, I'm not sure if I should do this or not. I know, I'll ask my friends on earth and get their opinion. See if their culture agrees. And if their culture agrees, I'll do it. And if their culture's against it, well, maybe I'll hold back. No. God is asking me, a man, to agree with his assessment. Because he wants us to understand. He wants us to be involved. He wants us to have a right mindset. And he wants us to be pure for him. And he wants to test our loyalty and see, do we agree with him in the truth of what he's doing? But it's amazing, isn't it? God is asking me, a man, to agree with him. 
And that's what he asks you and, us, you and I to do. To acknowledge and agree with what he's doing. Said in several times in Revelation, um, there are those times when people are saying to God, righteous and true are your judgments. I want to share just one of those in Revelation 16 and verses 4 to 7. Uh, this is in the context of the bowls of wrath. Revelation 16 and verses 4 to 7, we see that the third angel turns the rivers and the springs of water to blood. And then it says in verse 5, I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judged these things. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar, whether or not that's the believers there, but I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. God brings about judgment. His servants acknowledge why he's doing it and that it's just. And I believe that's one thing that the Lord would have us do as we gain a heavenly mindset to acknowledge and agree with what he's doing and seeking to do. Secondly, there may be times when it is appropriate to pray for, to desire, dare I say, hesitantly, even to rejoice in God's judgment, as I'll explain. There's a psalm, we sing a song uh, sometimes based on it occasionally, Psalm 68 and verse 1, where it says, Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. Do we realise how that goes on? Because it goes on in the next verse to say that as the wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish before God. When we sing that song, or when we pray it in prayer, um, which I'm not criticising, um, when we say or sing those words and say, Lord, will you cause your enemies to be scattered, do we realise what we are asking? It's not always like that. The Lord might sometimes scatter his enemies, for example, by bringing politicians down from their positions. But in another way, sometimes God's judgment is death. Do we realise what it is that we are praying for? And that it's biblical. Of course, that was written in the Old Testament, but I think we've demonstrated that there are times in the New where we see a similar idea. Phinehas's action, although costly, turned away God's anger and judgment from the wider people. God says, he has turned away my anger. And perhaps that's a reason why sometimes we need to pray for certain individuals to be judged, so that the wider nation or wider church isn't judged or led into further sin. Phinehas's action led to two people losing their lives, but many others having their lives saved. Is there ever an appropriate time to rejoice over people's judgments? I said I said it hesitantly, um, partly because it's a very uncomfortable to consider. Well, there is the verse in Psalm 58 and verse 10, this will very rarely be read in church, where it says that the righteous will rejoice at when they see God's vengeance and will wash their feet in the blood of the wicked. Wow, that's an alien verse, isn't it? Um, and obviously we understand the context in the Old Testament where there were the, the fights between armies and the righteous did um, end up killing the wicked in battle um, as they went out. And yet in Revelation 18 and verse 20, where we see Babylon's destruction and surely encapsulated in some way, however we interpret, interpret that, encapsulated somewhere within Babylon's destruction would be people's judgment. In Revelation 18 and verse 20, it says, Rejoice over her, you saints and apostles and prophets, because God had pronounced judgment for you against her. They're told to rejoice. Well, I don't want to dwell on that point. I just uh, throw it out there, really. But whether or not we're to rejoice at judgment, we are certainly called sometimes to pray for it. And I just want to give an illustration which is hot off the press shall we say, which is that at the conference this week, 
as we considered these things and also things that Josh shared and as we prayed through things and we were together as a group seeking the Lord's leading, in the final session we reached a point where we felt that God was leading us not just to pray for a separation between the true church and the rebellious church, but actually to pray that the Lord would judge those in the in the church who were not going to repent. We still at the same time expressed a prayer that the Lord would cause them to turn, but we said, Lord, if you are not going to, will you judge them? And the reason we prayed that was not because we had a coldness towards them. It was because we recognized that we need that separation to be clear. We need people to see that the true church is different from them. And because we don't want people to be led astray anymore by false prophets and false teachers. We want them to be delivered from them. And the Lord's method may be judgment in that. So I just give that as an example. Uh, of course, I know that uh, others here weren't there, and so you mustn't just take my word for it. Um, but just sharing that that's how we began to feel led. And we went there hesitantly, and we went there struggling a bit in one sense, because we didn't want to see uh, people in the church judged. And yet we felt that was on God's heart. That perhaps the time has come now, the line in the sand where we say, actually, there have been chances given. And denomination after denomination has voted to bring in what God has said is wrong. And yet, the final thing, the final uh, point of what our attitude should be to God's judgment is that there are other times, probably more times, when we should be moved to intercede so that God's judgment would be held back, reduced, or even prevented. Many of the Old Testament prophecies of judgment were given not to say, whatever you do, this judgment is coming, you can't do anything about it, so you might as well just get used to it. No, they were given in the, with the desire that people would hear and repent, and that those who knew the Lord would intercede. In Isaiah 63, where we see the Lord trampling again that winepress of God's wrath that we also see in Revelation, it says the Lord looked for a man but was amazed to find none. God looked for somebody or people to come and pray and put things right so that he didn't need to judge. We know that God was willing to spare the whole of Sodom, even though he said its outcry was great and its sin was exceedingly grave, even if there were just <coughs> ten righteous people within it. As Abraham interceded, that's the point that the Lord reached with him. If just ten righteous within that whole city. Reminder of the importance of righteousness and the importance of intercession in trying to hold back the Lord's judgment when possible. Now it does help if we have our eyes open to the seriousness of the situation. The more we see, shall we say, God's judgment on the horizon and the dark clouds approaching, the more we'll be motivated to pray. We need to be stirred up sometimes, often even, to recognise the Lord's judgment is coming and that should make us to act we, like Ezekiel, are called to be watchmen who see the judgment coming, who see the disaster approaching on the city, and take action. And so in that connection, just one final passage to, to read this morning is from Amos chapter 7. Amos chapter 7. Where three times God speaks of judgment that is coming... And it's an amazing encouragement to us as we close in intercession and about God's mercy. Because in Amos chapter 7, I won't read the passage but you can see it there, that God is forming two judgments, one after another, in Amos 7. A locust swarm and then a fire. And on both occasions... Amos says, Lord God, please stop or please pardon. How can Jacob stand for he is small? And the Lord responds by changing his mind, saying it shall not be. 
Now we should note that the third time God goes on to say, I will spare them no longer. So it's not that God is saying, I'm giving up on judgment completely. But there's just a principle here, isn't there? That God first of all shows his servant judgment that's coming. Then his servant prays. And then God is willing, at least for a time or to some extent, to show mercy. Later on, Jeremiah would be told not to pray. He was, he was later than Amos, and they had reached a point where the Lord was not going to be willing to judge. God showed the judgment, but he wasn't going to be willing to hear those prayers anymore. But here God shows the judgment to Amos with the express intention of Amos praying. And isn't that an encouragement to us, friends? That when we see God's judgment, uh, that we can intercede. An encouragement to us to pray that the Lord would show us what is coming so that we can have a right understanding of it. Sometimes we may be called to pray for it to happen. Sometimes as it falls, we may be called to accept it and acknowledge and even praise the Lord for it, acknowledging he's righteous. But other times the Lord calls us to intercede. And you know, the thing is, as we increasingly are saying from the pulpit and, and in our prayer times, dark times are coming, and we know that from what the Bible says and from what we see in our world sin is increasing, surely we can see that God's judgment is going to be coming more and more. And so these things we considered this morning are going to become more and more important. We're going to be living through days where God's judgment is at least more and more approaching, if not even more and more poured out. And this is a chance for us all to ask ourselves, Lord, and to ask the Lord, do we have a right attitude to his judgment? As we see it approaching and as we even see it falling, are we ready to have the right approach to it? Will we side with the world? Or will we side with the Lord and his purposes? Well, it's a great challenge to me. It's a great challenge, I'm sure, to all of us. But an encouragement too, that we can pray and that the Lord can act, even in mercy, even when his judgment is due to fall. Well, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we bring our attitudes to you and our hearts and our emotions to you. Lord, you uh, formed us, Lord, and we know that compassion is a part of your character which you've worked in us. But Lord, we pray that where our attitude to your judgment is wrong, Lord, would you deal with that, Lord? Lord, where we have a fleshly mindset rather than an earthly one, we pray that you would work that change that your word speaks of. Where there is that metamorphosis, Lord, from a, a, an earthly mindset to a heavenly one. We pray that you would work that. And Lord, we ask for your leading individually and as a church in our prayer times, Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand when we are to pray against judgment uh, and when we are to pray even for it, Lord, uh, any times when that's appropriate. Lord, would you lead us so that we can pray effectively, Lord. Lord, help us to know what you are doing and wanting to do in each situation and, and what response you're looking for. Lord, whatever the world does and whatever others in the church does, may we do and think and say the things that are in line with you, siding with you, whatever the cost. We don't say that lightly, Lord, but we say, would you work that in us, we pray. For your glory, Lord, for your kingdom to come and and for us to be pleasing to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.